Live with ClickOrlando.com. This is News 6 at 6, getting results. Right now we are following breaking news out of Orange County. Glad you're with us tonight. I'm Matt Austin. And I'm Lisa Bell. Orange County Public Schools has canceled one of its football games due to COVID-19 cases. News 6's Lauren Cervantes has the latest from the district. I spoke with Orange County Public Schools after 2 o'clock this afternoon, and at the time they said they didn't have any of the numbers for the teams that were tested yesterday and today. But less than an hour ago, OCPS says they now have the numbers for one school and say that a football game is now being canceled. Orange County Public Schools says tomorrow's football game between Evans High School and West Orange High School is canceled due to positive COVID-19 cases that resulted in quarantining of football players. OCPS says says there were five positive COVID-19 cases that resulted in the quarantine of the entire team, including coaches and trainers. School officials say that anyone who may have been exposed to one of those who tested positive have been notified. The district says at this time, the West Orange High School football game scheduled for next Friday is still happening. OCPS says as a precaution, the entire campus is now being cleaned and disinfected. In Orange County, I'm Lauren Cervantes, getting results, News 6. Lauren, thank you. News 6 is tracking all of the COVID-19 cases reported at Central Florida schools. You can search by district right now in our COVID-19 school database. That's available at clickorlando.com slash coronavirus. We're also following the latest developments in the Florida panhandle as what is now Tropical Storm Sally continues to dump rain from Florida to Alabama. The storm made landfall as a Cat 2 hurricane just before 5 this morning. But this thing continues to flood the panhandle and the state is sending resources to help. We've activated 500 Florida National Guard soldiers. Uh, we have uh, air assets, helicopters, and 50 high water vehicles. Uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Conservation Commissioner also has 50 special operations group members uh, who are also standing by to assist, uh, as does Florida Highway Patrol. For the latest on Sally and what's happening here in Central Florida, let's get over to Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Hey, Tom. You know, so we tend to try to compare storms to storms, and none of them are ever exactly alike. But this is more akin to a Francis or a Jean, and that it was moving so slow that it put down all kinds of heavy rain. Some areas over there picking up close to 25, 20, maybe up to 30 inches of rain in windows over there in certain spots. This is where it is tonight, already crossed the state line. Wind speeds are 60 miles per hour, winds gusting up to 70, it's on a route to take it over Atlanta in the next 24 hours. Not as an organized storm or anything, but with winds of 30 miles per hour. Tonight, here at home, we have tropical moisture, some downpours still happening. I'll be right back to pinpoint all of these, take you on a radar tour, and then break out more tropical rain for tomorrow. All right, Tom, thank you. Well, students across Central Florida are almost a month into what we can only call a weird school year, but with the end of the first nine weeks approaching, Seminole County parents can decide if it's time for a change. Right now, 37% of students are enrolled in virtual learning through Seminole Connect. Another 38% chose face-to-face. -face. The rest of Seminole students chose a hybrid format or Save My Seat virtual school. News Six's Nadine Giannis talked to one principal about preparing to welcome more students safely. On Friday, parents here in Seminole County will get a survey to determine what they want to do at the nine week mark if your student is currently taking Seminole Connect. So you can choose. You can stay with Seminole Connect for the second nine weeks, come back to school full face to face, or do a hybrid of both. At the nine weeks, I'm expecting a number of our Connect students to return. Standing in an empty classroom used for only one period a day, Lake Mary High School Principal Dr. Mickey Reynolds is ready to revamp class sizes and schedules all over again in just a few weeks. The survey goes out later this week, so we don't have hard numbers. But just in communicating with some of the 623 parents of students at her school currently on Seminole Connect, she feels many would want to come back to the classroom. I would say about a third is what I'm predicting about a third coming back. I still think there are the families that aren't taking any chances. So logistically, we're asking how it would work. Those students will be in classrooms that we already have running. Um, we will not create any more uh, new sections. 
we can't hire any more new teachers. The plan is set up so students can easily drop into the same class with the same teacher and same students, either in person or online. But if many choose to come back to face to face, it could increase class sizes. Now that's going to add desks, right? And so we may not be able to socially distance all the desks. But this is why we're wearing our masks. Dr. Reynolds taking pride in the fact five weeks in and Lake Mary hasn't had a single case of COVID transmitted on campus, she says. I do want parents to know that I feel totally confident for their child to come. Only knowing for sure once the surveys are sent out to the more than 30,000 students on Seminole Connect on Friday. But they will need to be returned quickly. The district giving only five days. Those surveys due back next Wednesday. In Seminole County, Nadine Yanis getting results. News 6. Thank you, Nadine. Osceola County also offering families the option to change how and where their student is learning. The district says students can switch to digital learning or face-to-face -face learning to finish the first semester. Those preferences must be reported to your child's school by noon this Friday. So far, more than 4.9 million Floridians have been tested for COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. The state could pass the 5 million mark as soon as tomorrow. Florida continues to hold under the 5% positivity rate threshold. Today's 4.47% makes the fifth consecutive day under 5%. Just over 2,300 new cases were reported in the last 24 hours, along with 154 deaths and 197 hospitalizations. Researchers still working on a vaccine for COVID-19, but when it is ready, the U.S. government says it will be free for Americans. The government's vaccine plan was released today. President Trump's Operation Warp Speed calls for vaccines to be ready for shipment within 24 hours of FDA approval. But those first doses could be limited. The government says they will go to health workers, essential employees, and vulnerable groups. States and cities must submit their plans for receiving and distributing vaccine doses. The government's also pushing for technology to track who's getting the vaccine and when. Right now, several pharmaceutical companies are running their own clinical trials on a potential vaccine. Some of that research is even happening right here in Central Florida. That's right, but there are questions about whether the participants in those studies truly reflect the U.S. population. Black Americans make up 13% of the U.S. population, while Latinos represent another 18% of Americans. Both groups are underrepresented in the vaccine trials. Even though a study found they are more than four times likely to be hospitalized for COVID-19 compared to white Americans, now there are efforts to recruit more minority participants. News 6's Amanda Castro talked with a Volusia County man who is among the minorities being tested. Coffee. We were there as Gregorio Rivera got his first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. If somehow I can help them find a cure or something to at least alleviate the situation, I think I did my part as a citizen. The 64-year-old, originally from Puerto Rico, now calling Central Florida home, serving in the United States Army for 15 years. His drive to serve his country, bringing him to excel research sites into land to participate in the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine trial. I think it's a way to help solve this big health issue. The facility actively recruiting participants like Rivera trying to get minorities to take part in the study. Deep breath for me. Dr. Bruce Rankin is leading the efforts. He says minorities are disproportionately affected by the virus. These groups are usually less likely to have uh, enough medical care, so they're ending up sicker in the hospitals. CBS News reporting black Americans and Latinos are more than four times likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 compared to white Americans. Dr. Rankin says minorities need to participate to get a better understanding of how a vaccine can help. We still want to make sure we get good representation of those groups, so we'll do anything and everything we can to get people in those groups that may want to participate. He says so far, 10% of the more than 1,300 participants in their study are minorities. Moderna saying nationwide, 27% of participants come from, quote, diverse communities. Why do you think there is uh, an underrepresentation amongst these groups? Well, a lot of times there's hesitancy uh, from amongst all types of groups of doing a vaccine trial because there's a lot of misunderstandings about it. Rivera saying some may be afraid, but ultimately he wants to do his part. By participating in research like this and then being a Hispanic, what else can I do for my race? In DeLand, Amanda Castro getting results, News 6. Well, between wearing masks or working and learning from home, a lot about normal life has changed during the pandemic. Now two Florida lawmakers say they have an idea that could maybe bring everyone a little stability at least. Plus, Central Florida is home 
to people of a variety of cultures. And in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, we're looking back on how one particular group helped shape the community we know today. You're watching News 6 at 6, getting results for Beverly Beach, Reddick, and all of Central Florida. We will be right back. Brought to you by Advent Health, where nothing is more important than you. Live with Matt Austin, Lisa Bell, weather with Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells, and sports with Sports Director Jamie Say. This is News 6 at 6, getting results. Central Florida may be best known for its theme parks in the Space Coast, but we know there's a whole lot more to this area that we all call home. Much more. It's not just about what is here, but the people and cultures who make up this community. News 6 is joining the celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, which dates all the way back to President Lyndon B. Johnson's administration. Tonight, our Carolina Cardona shows us the impact of the Puerto Rican community here in Central Florida. Central Florida is home to a melting pot of Hispanic and Latino communities. Restaurants and businesses have become a staple here, specifically those owned by Puerto Ricans. The Puerto Rican population in Central Florida is, is huge and continues to grow. A population Dr. Luis Martinez, a history professor at UCF, says began in the 1970s. Part of it had to do with veterans who were retiring and moved to this area. Another factor was a real estate company, which introduced Central Florida as a place where they could thrive and build a home right next to Disney World. In the 70s and into the 80s, uh, had some very aggressive marketing, not just in Puerto Rico, but also in New York City, where the largest concentration of Puerto Ricans still is. In Central Florida, Orlando and Kissimmee are where most Puerto Ricans have established themselves, making up a large part of its economic growth. You have business owners who have expanded or relocated to Central Florida. You have people who have relocated without really having a job, but well prepared, educated, and they've been able to excel by establishing their own businesses. Conrad Santiago is one of the co-founders of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and board member of Prospera, a nonprofit that helps Latinos with entrepreneurship. Puerto Rico is well known for the arts, food, and we have seen their contributions you know, to the community throughout the years in different aspects. In 2019, 39% of Prospera's clients were Puerto Ricans. How those businesses from the start, they have evolved, developed, you know, and been successful. Immigrants in general, bring a strong work ethic because we, we, we have to fight harder to reach positions of authority. There's certain aspects that, that we also bring to the table, such as a sense of community, which is stronger, a, a sense of the family, which goes beyond the, the basic uh, unit of parents and children. In Orlando, Carolina Cardona, News 6. So we now have several stories about Hispanics and their contributions to our community and country right now on our website. We will also add that throughout Hispanic Heritage Month on clickorlando.com slash Hispanic Heritage. It is almost time to change the clocks and fall back, but Florida senators are pushing to put off the time change until next year. The legislation would stop any time change until November of 2021. Senators Rick Scott and Marco Rubio say the bill would provide stability for Americans during the pandemic. Right now we are set to fall back to standard time on November 1st. This is an issue that gets brought up year after year. Things get passed and they never change. Willing so. to bet we're going to be falling back soon. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't count on that. Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells joins us now with a look at the weather. We can also count on some very active tropics. At this uh, yeah, and I think the hits are going to keep on coming for at least another five or six weeks here in the tropics. Tonight we're watching Sally, watching this area, watching Teddy could become a major hurricane. Watching Paulette lose her mojo. Yes. Vicki, still a tropical storm in this area right here, has a 70% shot of developing in the next five days. Early model runs bring it this way and kind of following Teddy. That would be a best case scenario. We'd love to see it stay out there in the open water. In the meantime, here's the visible satellite. I keep going to it because it is fading fast. By 7 p.m., if you're here, I won't be able to use it anymore. You see, it has advanced and has started to move a little quicker. And by a little, I mean twice as fast as it was going this morning. 
Forward progress is up to the northeast at seven miles per hour now. This was the five o'clock locator. We'll get an intermediate advisory coming up at eight. It's going to zoom all the way through Georgia into South Carolina in the next 48 hours. Here's radar tonight. What used to be the eye wall is here now. North of Dothan, going to swing through Montgomery and roll on up into Macon, north of Albany, the big rain from Valdosta up to the north. Here's local radar right now. We are still dealing with scattered showers in central Florida, some of which are super heavy. Over here around the villages, you see the activity. Now Leesburg getting some rain, getting in on the party as well. Zoom in tight there and show you exactly what's happening. Fruitland Park, you don't have much rain yet, except for the western the little side of Fruitland Park there might be getting some rain. All of this, though, is moving up to the north this way pushing on up. So you'll end up with some rain in Fruitland Park through parts of Lake County up to Marion County as well. Northeastern Marion getting some big rain. Ocala, Dunellen dry again, although this may come to you in Dunellen. The area down here, the outflow boundary from the earlier storms, really erupted south of Osceola County. Here's Yeehaw Junction getting some action, but it's just south of there where it really did blow up. Temperatures have been super affected by the rain this afternoon. If you've had rain, you're cooler. The village is 78, but Kissimmee 89. Tonight into the evening, some of this stuff moves on over from the Gulf Coast into your backyard. So I can't really say it's all over yet. Normally, but I'm like, ah, it's over, but it's not. There'll be some more showers tonight. By 3.30 tomorrow, we're back in the moisture. Here's tomorrow night by 7 p.m. Widely scattered showers, little pockets of heavy rain. And then into Friday, much of the activity is finally south and east. The overnight low tonight is 75. Here's tomorrow. Your forecast brought to you by Del Air Heating and Air Conditioning. Daytime high tomorrow, tags 92 again. The rain shows up in the afternoon. Check out the week ahead. Calling it 92 tomorrow, 92 on Friday, 90 on Saturday. But by Sunday, a frontal boundary approaches. And look at how much cooler we are next week. So in the 90s for now. But by Monday, the high should only be 85. All Ooh. right, that sounds magical, that Tom is Sorrell. Amazing. Thank Get you. Get up at earmuffs. Yeah. Well, he is a man of the cloth working to build bridges between deputies and the community. It is a great story. Yeah. Tonight at 7, he has picked an unorthodox way to do it. How can I not be in ministry and not be in law enforcement officer? Because I believe it's one. Ahead at 7, why joining the sheriff's office as a captain fulfills a pledge to his dying grandmother and how it may already be getting results. I think this is the worst move to make, honestly. Thirty years used during wildfires, floods, hurricanes. Volusia County Sheriff defends a $340,000 decision. Why he says buying another armored transport vehicle is not an example of militarizing the police force. That's coming up at 7. All right, Sports Director Jamie Say is here now. Jamie, the Big Ten calls an audible today. Yes, it does. The conference changes its play call that it made five weeks ago, and football is back on for this fall. The Big Ten's high-profile head coaches are happy. We're going to hear from one of them, plus how this conference plans to keep football safe from COVID next. Welcome back to News 6 and welcome back. Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Wisconsin, and more. The Big Ten is joining the fall football party after all. The conference announced today it will play a football season starting next month. So out of all the five Power Five leagues, now only the Pac-12 has no plan to kick off this fall. The Big Ten's first games will be, will be the weekend of October 24th. Teams will play eight games over eight weeks with the Big Ten title game on December 19th. That's one day before the college football playoff field is announced. Ohio State is expected to contend. Um, I know our resident Buckeyes fan, Tom Searles, is very excited to have Ohio State right back Come in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> Buckeyes head coach Ryan Day was one of many who criticized the Big Ten's original decision to postpone kickoff until spring. All 14 Big Ten school presidents now voted to reverse course, citing better testing and new medical information. Every football player in the Big Ten will be tested daily beginning September 30th. Any player who tests positive will have to wait at least 21 days to return to competition and will undergo cardiac testing. No fans will be allowed into Big Ten games. Excited for the players because, you know, they never lost faith. They never lost trust. Their behavior through this time has been excellent, and they never stopped fighting. And uh, it was during a time that was very, very uncertain. 
Meanwhile, UCF is finally three days away from kicking off its season. It's 3.30 Saturday against Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And by George, George is going to be there. Georgia Tech is honoring its former coach and the Knights' former coach, George O'Leary, on Saturday. He was selected for the Yellow Jackets Hall of Fame. College football is such a small world because Georgia Tech's current head coach, Jeff Collins, used to work for O'Leary at UCF. Collins, along with his freshman quarterback, Jeff Sims, just led the Jackets to a come-from-behind win at Florida State over the weekend. Tech certainly has UCF's attention, and it sounds like the Knights are chomping at the bit to get after the football on Saturday. They're a great offense. Like, they run similar to our offense, you know, a fast-paced offense. Jeff Sims, you know, he's a running quarterback, you know, but he also can pass. So I think we got our hands full with this this offensive scheme that they got going on. And our mindset right now, especially for the offensive line, it's just go out there, play as hard as you can for as long as you can. Uh, and everything's going to work out for us. We cannot wait for kickoff on Saturday. Night Nation, join Ryan Welch and me Saturday night at 11.35 or after the whistle. We're going to break down UCF's season opener at Georgia Tech. We'll also feature the Miami Hurricanes matchup with Louisville and more. That is after the whistle this and every Saturday night at 11.35 on News 6. The NBA bubble is down to its final four. Only the Heat, Celtics, Lakers, and Denver Nuggets are still at Disney playing for the NBA championship. Denver's playoff run is a story that should make Cinderella proud. With a convincing fourth quarter last night, the Nuggets beat the odds and beat the L.A. Clippers, sending Kawhi Leonard and company back to Los Angeles. The Clips were one of the favorites to win the NBA title when uh, the season resumed. Now they're eliminated. The Nuggets were not one of the favorites, but now Denver has the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals. That series starts on Friday. News 6 at 6 will be right back.